kind introduction here. Um, it's uh, really my great uh, pleasure and, and privilege to uh, be with you today to share with you um, some thoughts and some of our work uh, in this uh, extremely important and uh, very fast evolving nexus between, uh, on the one hand, um, dynamic modeling and system science, and on the other, uh, aspect of data science. Um, uh, two, two subtexts that I'd like to use for this talk is uh, number one, um, uh, in addition to the title, Dynamic uh, Health Policy Modeling the Age of Big Data, um, I use the term uh, moving beyond myth and madness. And this harks back to a comment by um, epidemiologist Phil Zuckerman um, that uh, modeling without data is myth and data without modeling is madness. And I'm going to be talking here about a set of techniques that we've applied very successfully across a broad range of different uh, health conditions um, that, that really move us beyond myth and madness uh, jointly um, into uh, what I believe is, a, is a, a much more solid space for informing health policy modeling. Um, secondly, though, um, I sometimes use the term systems competent data science to describe um, the vision I'm, I'm articulating here, recognizing that all too often, even um, in today's world, um, data science is practiced in a way that individual data sets are viewed as solitudes, or if not solitudes, as sort of fragmented parts of some heap of related data, rather than as a full-bodied uh, participant, citizens, as it were, of a, of a system, of an interlinked system. Um, and uh, I'm going to be motivating a broader view of data science, working jointly with system science um, that, can, uh, that can allow us to leverage data science in a way that's uh, more fundamental and more true to the nature of systems and thereby more effective in informing uh, health policy. So today's talk um, is going to be one that, I, wh whilst uh, this audience draws heavily from those uh, involved in data science on the one hand and system science on the other, um, I'm going to assume a, a general background for the audience. Um, I'm therefore going to go into some motivations for, on the one hand, system science, talking about complex health problems and the role of, of system science as the science of a whole that helps us um, more effectively grapple with, understand, and manage these tangled um, systems that all too often are the gnarly problems that, that uh, confound policy. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to talk about health big data. Many people will be very comfortable with this space, and I'll be going lighter there uh, on the many types uh, which we've employed. Um, to, to focus in on one type, um, which in some discussions with Lorette um, had seemed it might be of particular interest, um, uh, which uh, has to do with uh, some of the systems that have come out of our lab for leveraging smartphones and wearables uh, in a way that, that really leverage these tools we'll be talking about in that, that next section of the talk that bring together data science and system science as a, as a whole. Um, uh, I'm going to spend a bit more time on that, going lighter on the earlier sections um, in reference to the uh, the interests and background of, of most people listening in, and then I'll, I'll offer some conclusions. So um, whilst I'll go light on these uh, first two sections, I, I do want to drive apart or drive across uh, certain um, high-level points. Um, the motivation for us coming to this work, as indeed I think is reflective of, of uh, uh, much of the fantastic efforts going on there at, at McGill, uh, at Pittsburgh, at Hopkins lies in the fact that we're grappling uh, with ever more complex health policy challenges. Um, I've enumerated a set uh, here, but they, they range from you know, the, the challenges associated with uh, uh, a graying population with more complicated multi-condition morbidities um, to issues having to do with uh, the growth of blowback to our intervention effects, such as um, antimicrobial resistance, for example. Um, to the uh, the gnawing um, the effects that are that are very troubling on on, on um, yawning health disparities. Um, uh, these these conditions um, or the, these areas are 
confounding, um, not merely because they're complicated, but because they are, in a technical sense, uh, complex. They're, they're nonlinear. They, they exhibit features of a nonlinear system, which have um, uh, enormous consequences for effective uh, ability to understand and manage them. Um, and within such nonlinear systems, um, uh, the behavior of, of the whole system or the system at different scales can be very distinct from the behavior of its parts. Um, and uh, reflecting that, these systems often react surprisingly and, and pervasively uh, to interventions. Intervening at one part of the system will often ripple through to lead to changes across the system, changes which are often delayed, which are are additionally complicated by the presence of uh, reciprocal uh, causality feedbacks um, and that are often um, pop up in distal areas of the system in very unexpected ways. And as a result, the effects of, uh, of a given intervention can often be very distinct from what we expect. It can kick up all sorts of side effects. But moreover, um, uh, the effects of a, of a policy portfolio, for example, um, uh, can be very different in their aggregate impact than what would be uh, expected by analyzing each piece in isolation and summing up the effects. Um, so we're dealing with these systems which exhibit uh, feedbacks and delays and accumulations and nonlinearities in ways that lead to very surprising behavior. And um, within these systems, we see often very different behavior at, at different scales. The system adapts and learns in ways that often thwart our best uh, policy intentions and, and um, uh, best uh, thought out um, uh, comprehensive groupings of intervention. Um, and uh, often uh, heterogeneity within these systems is greatly magnified. So certain um, vulnerable groups perhaps or core groups um, to use the language of mathematical epidemiology within a, um, uh, an infectious disease system. Um, often small fragments of the population have very disproportionate impacts. For example, keeping a communicable disease alive in a population in a way that population-wide analysis would suggest that it, it uh, should die out. And finally, there's aspects of history dependence and lock-in, which, which mean that we need to uh, be aware not just of um, the, uh, the impacts of our policy in isolation, um, but rather the context as it has developed up over the years. Now, of course, within health, we've secured profound gains looking back over the past uh, you know, century and a half from the work of, of John Snow and others um, in, in uh, that, that uh, proverbial pump for cholera, but in, in many other health gains. And reductionist approaches have no question about it secured uh, great advantages. But when it comes to understanding about these effects at different scales, reasoning from the micro level to the meso and macro level, when it comes to reasoning about the impact of multiple interventions or these very entangled systems, these syndemics, um, the, the reductionist approaches which have focused us on the pieces or parceling out associations into particular subpieces as if they add up to the whole uh, can be um, very limited. Um, they're a key tool in the toolbox, reductionist approaches, um, but they're, they're not the, the complete solution that we need to address this new generation of, of gnarly, tangled systems. In many ways, um, traditionally, we've, we've been like uh, the blind man and the elephant each exploring a piece of the system, um, but really to stop the rampages of that element, uh, of that elephant, to stop the, the health burdens it's creating, we need to understand the elephant as a whole. Go beyond an understanding of the pieces and really hark back to the whole. Um, now, these challenges are particularly, um, uh, particularly textured in and uh, iconic in two different areas. The one area is, is we need to understand what's going on within a system. Um, and often this takes the form of asking, does the evidence support a cherished hypothesis that I built up? Or where's the situation likely to go next? What's driving these patterns that I see? Even things like, is, are these patterns that I see, say, growing number of reported cases, 
uh, a sign of, of, of bad news, a crisis in the making, um, reflecting you know, a, a growing incidence of the underlying, uh, say, infection as it transmits in the disease or the underlying health burden from uh, behavioral factors? Or is this actually good news because it's a reflection of the degree to which um, we're securing more effective reporting over time, we're bringing people into the healthcare system that weren't presenting for care previously, and this is part of draining the swamp, as it were. Um, uh, when we are dealing with uh, informal reasoning alone, to go from kind of some hypothesis about what might be behind a trend like that, or the empirical patterns that we see, to try to understand the degree to which it jives with, it aligns with, it, it, it's consistent with empirical observation, we have a real quandary traditionally because it's hard for us using traditional methods and relying on, on our informal reasoning to total up whether our hypothesis naturally gives rise to, naturally implies, is it's consistent with and the behavior it generates over time, the empirical observation. An even more challenging issue comes up in the form of intervention. We're seeking within these gnarly, tangled systems, these systems where the whole is greater than the parts, to intervene. We'd like to know where to intervene, uh, primary prevention, secondary prevention, how to intervene. We ask um, inter uh, implementation science questions. How soon will I see effect? Um, how can I best scale this up? To what degree can I translate a finding from Montreal to uh, a finding from um, a smaller community. To what degree can we make this implementation financially sustainable? Here, we're dealing not only with that, with that uh, original foundational question about how to total up uh, a hypothesis about what's going on in the population to see if it's consistent with outcomes that we observe empirically, but now we have to, we throw into the mix interventions. And when we're relying on informal reasoning or traditional methods, um, this, this uh, takes us beyond what we can reasonably understand with, with uh, surety about the impacts of interventions. Um, and we're asking here about counterfactuals often, uh, issues which we've never seen in place before, and where the data just isn't available to allow us to use associations from the past to inform our reasoning. And as a result, we often, we often end up in a bad way. We undertake interventions which come back and smack us in the head. We end up solving, perhaps, or helping to ameliorate one problem, and it ends up creating another all too often. Or, you know, we end up putting our, our resources into the system, which at some level um, builds system uh, access to those resources, but where they're misplaced in a way that systematically leads the system to, as it were, go around in circles with an imbalance that simply shifts the bottleneck to a different area of the system. And so once again, reasoning through using traditional methods or in informal understanding the impacts of interventions or, or even being able to explain empirical patterns is really challenging with these tangled systems, with these tangled systems that not only have lots of moving parts, but where an understanding of the parts doesn't lead to an understanding of the whole, as much as understanding how cars work individually and how axles are designed and engines doesn't give us insight into how traffic jams are formed and, and resolved most effectively. So fortunately, within science over the past several decades, um, there's been uh, great advances in terms of, of understanding systems of this sort, understanding nonlinear systems. Um, and I particularly would like to, to, to um, spend some time with you discussing this science of the whole I referred to in my opening remarks. Complexity science, as it's sometimes served, termed, or system science. And really, these tools, which I'm going to use here somewhat interchangeably, although there's some subtleties involved, um, uh, help us uh, visualize or depict, understand, and reason about um, uh, these uh, complex systems more effectively, and ultimately help us manage uh, these systems, or help us nudge these systems in a way that's subject to blowback and knock-on effects. 
less subject to us being smacked in the head by unintended side effects. And a central way in which system science helps us, by no means the only way, and not even the only way we apply, um, we, we very much tap into other aspects of system science in ways I won't go into here, um, but a central way is by fostering dynamic models. And, and these models depict hypothesize, to use the language of critical realism, which is very compatible with the system science view, these models help us understand uh, the generative mechanisms at all. Um, we often formulate models at, at very different um, uh, levels. Uh, many of these models are multi-scale models incorporating phenomena at the physiologic level as well as at the health system level, perhaps service delivery, and at the public health level. And they're often situated in context, again, harking back to, uh, uh, to, to critical realism where we have context, mechanism, and outcome. And context is very important. They're situated in certain contexts. And I won't go into it here, but best used, these models are not viewed as crystal balls that somehow project forward in a, um, in, a, in, a, a wet, in a rigid way, forecasting what will happen, but rather they're learning tools. They're tools to help us learn more quickly, more effectively, and more reliably when our thinking is off. They help us go from underlying understanding of the hypothesis to, to understanding its logical implications over time in ways that allow us to test um, whether it's consistent with empirical observations. This harks back to the words of Francis Bacon in the later part of the 1600s, commenting that one can more quickly learn from error than from confusion. In other words, he was encouraging us, as in modern parlance, fail early, fail often. Take some stance, recognizing it's provisional, recognizing it's a working hypothesis, test it out, and uh, if it's if it's consistent with the evidence, we've gained some good understanding and some wind in our sails. If it's not consistent with the evidence, we've also learned a critical fact that merely musing about the situation would not have gained us. And so, in short, it's better to be transiently wrong by taking a working hypothesis and showing that it's off base, showing that our, 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 our theory as captured in the model just doesn't cut it, it doesn't jive with the empirical observations, than it would be to to go around in a way confused about whether or not this adds up and is consistent with the evidence. And similarly, in terms of reasoning about interventions, these models provide us a way of going from a depiction of the underlying system to uh, an understanding of possible desired outcomes or, um, or uh, to outcomes to in a way that tests whether um, they meet our criteria, our desiderata for, for desirability. And these models enjoy many uses that have probably been featured in different webinars, whether asking what if, tool, uh, what if questions about interventions um, uh, to allow us to explain trends, like those growing uh, cases, uh, reporting cases earlier, to prioritize data collection, and uh, to translate from one context to into another. Um, colleagues like Don Burke down there at Pittsburgh uh, over so many years or um, uh, Epstein at, at Hopkins um, uh, in years past have, have enumerated uh, dozens of ways in which these models can be uh, effectively used. But there's a challenge for many, not all, but many of those uses. Um, when it comes to building models to quantitatively inform trade-off between certain policies, all the more so um, things like cost-effectiveness analysis or, or techniques which really seek to, in a, in a quite precise way, understand uh, the trade-off between intervention portfolios. Many of the phenomena that we can capture with increasing clarity and, um, uh, and fidelity within these models, we, we actually lack corresponding evidence in the traditional literature and traditional means of data collection. So whether it's aspects of people's mobility patterns and where they're spending their time, their physical activity, who they're with and in what environments they're located, aspects of their decision-making rules and heuristics, we, we find uh, often our models have this impedance mismatch, to use a technical term from engineering, a, a mismatch in terms of the amount of data that we could use with them to ground them on the one hand with, with the amount of 
of evidence that's actually available in the population. We know since the MHANES 3 study in the states, just the, the yawning gap between, on the one hand, people's self-report of their physical activity and what's actually picked up with tools like accelerometers and these days with, with uh, a variety of other uh, tools, including heart rate monitors. Um, there's big gaps between what people say they eat and what they, what they do, in fact. Even things such as weight and our evidence uh, from, from studies uh, using um, the tools, the smartphone-based data collection will be seen, suggest big gaps between where people, in fact, spend time and what they report, or who they're with versus what's self-reported. So we're dealing with real shortages of data. Now, fortunately, we're in the, the age of big data here. I don't need to tell this audience about uh, the many types of electronically sourced data that are increasingly available. Data that's marked by the four Bs. High volume, that's the big and big data. But more significantly, particularly with dynamic models, high velocity, it's coming in quickly, high variety. At a given time, given participant, we often have multiple types of data collected. And for many cases, not all, but many, higher veracity. Not just uh, in terms of physical measures of location compared to self-report, but when you put together many sensors that can more definitively pin down, for example, are you outside and inside from combining light and GPS and Wi-Fi based sensing, et cetera, we can really pin things down. And our work has tapped a wide variety of types of these uh, when combined with, uh, with dynamic modeling. Um, in other versions of the talk, I, I talk about uh, the many insights that can be secured, for example, from monitoring Twitter data or monitoring uh, search, uh, search volume data. But today I'm going to focus more of my remarks on a mobile data collection. Um, this is an area which uh, we've uh, been pleased to help uh, advance. Um, our system, uh, Ethica, which came out of the IEPI project, uh, run over many years here at the uh, University of Saskatchewan, but now used in more than 100 studies worldwide in nine different languages. It's an Android and iPhone based wearable system. Um, participants generally, um, with exceptions of say indigent individuals, those on the very lower area of the socioeconomic spectrum who are given phones, people install it on their own phones. Um, or in coming iterations of system, simply access it uh, if they prefer via a browser-based interface which still collects, uh, allows collection of data from wearables. Um, we can collect a wide variety of type of information on a study-by-study -study, uh, basis that's configured differently, and a variety of, of add-ons from time use data to, to data collected on app use and, and uh, browsing, BA for chat, etc. These are all consenting adults. Individuals go through this system uh, through consent processes that are facilitated by the system. And then each study can configure the system without programming to have its own user interface, its own um, uh, buttons to trigger things, its own background images, uh, it's, um, more deeply uh, what data sources it collects, what questionnaires it asks. Questionnaires that are defined graphically in ways uh, that are similar to SurveyMonkey, for example, or Google Forms. And uh, the triggering conditions, the contextual triggers, trigger this when you're in a park, or trigger this when you're near a certain um, set of other participants, such as smokers, can be set up uh, within the system. And um, all of this can evolve in the studies, uh, uh, throughout a study. So we can have different data sources configured, and we can have uh, the particulars of the questionnaires and the triggering conditions uh, defined on a study-by-study -study specific basis. Now, a foremost goal here I don't have time to go into concerns security and privacy, where we have multiple levels of encryption uh, in, on REST and the phone and, and transmitted. And not surprisingly, this system, uh, we put a premium from the start when we started building the system back in 2009, 2010, on collecting this information that's hard to capture traditionally. This includes location, and physical proximity, people's eating patterns, people's uh, communication patterns and social context, etc. Give you a flavor of this, recognizing uh, the time. Um, uh, this is uh, one study we run with uh, uh, veterans uh, who are uh, suffering from PTSD and, and struggle with opioid uh, dependence. Um, this involves uh, uh, wearables um, in the form of uh, beacons that are 
that are um, worn by the, uh, the dog, um, which uh, allow us to track the amount of time the veteran spends with the dog. Additionally, veterans uh, are, are provided with uh, Fitbits uh, that can capture aspects of their sleep patterns, their heart rate, uh, and uh, aspects of physical activity with additional clarity beyond what the smartphone also collects. Um, and we can capture aspects of social context and location and so on uh, from smartphone sensors as well as some basics on, on sedentary behavior, physical activity, et cetera. Um, we have classic survey instruments uh, as well as in-person interviews, uh, prescribing history, et cetera. And so we can actually track using the system how much time the veteran is spending with the dog, um, aspects of, uh, of their uh, time spent inside, outside, um, the regularity of their schedule before they had a trained dog and, and when, they, uh, when they do, aspects of their physical activity and sedentary behavior, the sleep length, et cetera. So it gives us this picture over time that's, um, that's quite detailed and quite um, uh, rich and textured as to, for example, when periods of social engagement occurred, when aspects of substance use, whether opioids or, or, or use of uh, uh, cigarettes or alcohol, um, aspects of when the dog intervened, as it's trained to do, on uh, flashback occurrence. Uh, in short, it gives us a high velocity, high variety, and high veracity, um, as well as high volume uh, picture of, of things. Now, from a system science perspective, though, what it gives us is something more deep than that. If we think about the many effects of a dog on a sense of well-being, for example, we find there's many generative pathways that are hypothesized to operate, some through structure in the veteran's life, some through how much time they're spending with moderate to vigorous physical activity or, by contrast, with sedentary behavior. Some in a sense of companionship, um, but also contacts with the community. There's many, there's many of these uh, different generative pathways that one might identify, and traditional instruments give us some ability to, to pick up um, elements of this, but with that, uncertainty um, that self-report gives when it comes to factors such as mobility, factors such as time inside, outside, factors such as uh, people's physical activity, etc. Now with smartphones, we can, the data collected by smartphones and wearables using Ethica, um, complementing the, the questionnaires, the ecological momentary assessments popped up in the course many times a day, for example, we can really pin down a lot more of what's going on across multiple of these pathways. And that, that really helps build our understanding of the patterns before they had a trained dog and after, not just, not just broad outcomes such as their sense of well-being or their level of substance use, but in terms of along particular generative pathways, we can, we can tease out what some of the effects are. Um, now, this is going to be an important segue into my, my next section. Um, having talked about uh, big data at a very elemental level, or, or, you know, very ad hoc level, I'd like to return to the issue of dynamic model because this is key to taking best advantage of this data we've just talking about. It's also key for actually planning out that data collection in, in many studies how frequently you have to collect data or what sorts of data to collect in ways I won't go into. But dynamic modeling is a key element of making sense of, of this, uh, what could otherwise be a cacophony of data. Madness, as Phil Zuckerman called it, with data without modeling. So you recall dynamic modeling. Dynamic modeling, many of you are familiar with, so I didn't dwell on it, but it depicts uh, hypothesized generative mechanisms um, in ways that do not privilege them. It's not that we know they're correct, but rather by depicting them, we can more quickly spot inconsistencies in what's captured in the model and by extension what's captured in our thinking from empirical data and allows us to fail early, fail often, to advance or understand. Now, it turns out there's this natural synergy. It's, it's, it's a marriage made almost in heaven between on the one hand, the data we're getting, say from these sensors or from big data more generally, and dynamic models. And there's many aspects of this that our work has, has contributed. But I'm going to be sharing with you 
some particular ones that I, I think are um, of, of, of great importance. So one of them that I alluded to earlier, kind of in passing, um, just moments ago, was has to do with stimulating dynamic hypotheses. When we, when we go from that understanding of observing what's gone on before the veteran had a, a trained service dog, and after, and we notice big effects along perhaps certain pathways, but not others. Maybe notable changes in sedentary behavior, but less for physical activity. Or we, we note uh, a profound change in the structure of their life. Um, uh, in terms of the, the entropy, the sort of uh, predictability of their life, um, which we can compute and have contributed many papers examining uh, using big data. Um, this often will stimulate hypotheses about what's going on in the underlying system that will inspire our models. Um, while traditional methods um, pick out certain outcomes um, that are often fairly blunt, in the sense they don't tell us how we got there with great reliability using self-report that's pretty sketchy for things like you know how much time someone's spending outside or what they're eating. With, with big data, where we're asking people to take a photo, for example, of, of their food or, or uh, recording how much time they're spending outside using, using sensors uh, or how much physical activity we're getting, we can really pin things down in much, with much greater clarity about the pathways um, that, that might have been altered, say, by uh, an RCT. We were involved uh, uh, early on in some uh, seminal work in this area within uh, New York City and, and programs model left in the Moving to Opportunity program in the U.S., uh, where you know, we, we, we sought to use the smartphones to understand the pathways to effect of these, of these interventions. And that can give us understanding that can inform a dynamic model to, to better explore what's going on in those generative pathways. That's what dynamic models do. They capture those generative pathways after all. And here, finally, we're dealing with a data collection mechanism that allows us to, to capture data at the level of those generative pathways. So it's natural mix that it will inspire um, hypotheses in the dynamic model. And it can, in fact, be compared with what the dynamic model might expect to, to ground it more effectively. So we can also falsify models and, and um, better understand the impacts, for example, of, of intervention. So using measured data, we can often pick out, okay, just how did this move from a, of a family from a low-income neighborhood to a, a mixed-income neighborhood shift things? Or how much did giving a, a veteran access to this uh, fully trained service dog, how did it really change from their life uh, previously? Um, we, can, we can better understand the, how the intervention might have affected things, um, but we can also compare what we would have expected with a model along those same generative pathways and understand shortcomings of the model. And parlaying that with this idea that models are tools for failing early, failing often. They're tools for learning more effectively. They're learning prostheses that help us more quickly learn, more reliably learn, more deeply learn. They, they help us um, more quickly arrive at an improved model. And using that model, we can examine it to examine uh, alternatives, st intervention strategies that are counterfactual, where we don't have evidence, but the model can help us um, total up the implications. Another way in which these, um, this data can be used of uh, great significance, I'm kind of going through these in ways that lead to more quantitation and, and, and more, more uh, um, uh, quantitative uh, use of, of the data, is providing databases for uh, model parameterization and calibration. And I'll use a vignette here, foodborne illness, again conducted with Ethica now uh, a number of years in the past, I think it was 2015, 2016 or so, uh, uh, now, now um, enjoying uh, publication. Um, so here we configured Ethica, remember no programming involved, to have buttons to allow people to report when they're feeling sick and when they're eating and when each of those could call up this, uh, uh, these uh, questionnaires, again specified without uh, programming allowing collection of certain data. So when they reported uh, seeking care, presenting for care, 
we could ask, uh, or excuse me, when they reported being sick, we could ask, did they present for care? Ask them about the symptomology. Um, when they reported eating, for example, we could have them um, uh, report what they're eating and, and uh, for convenience do so in an audio or text way. And we could ask these momentary ecological assessments during the day. We had out outstanding um, um, involvement or adherence within the study with, with levels of, of answering of those EMAs between 90 and 95%. And, and um, as in quite a lot of Ethica studies, uh, very, very, uh, very, very good as, as it would be termed traditionally compliance um, in terms of the data collection. But what it gave us was, was exceptionally rich picture. For example, where people were eating, um, where they were eating outside of their homes, where, uh, where were they eating at food vendors, um, and uh, it gave us a picture of when they were, adhere, uh, they were eating at those food vendors from a temporal standpoint. Getting back to this idea of, of high velocity data as well as high variety data, we could pick out, you know, when, when were they eating from these vendors compared to when were they sick? and throw in the mix from a recurrent events analysis aspects of this, um, uh, when were they eating at home? And we could pin down where were they eating within the hours before they reported symptoms, for example, and is there clustering between different participants? We had a, a very rich, um, uh, well, I should say a rich, not very rich uh, model, uh, agent-based model concerning people's um, uh, use of food resources and the risk of foodborne illness. And with traditional data, we can only pin down parts of it. With this uh, other data, this data from smartphones, we could pick down a lot more and allowed us to estimate parameters. For example, that question about did people present for illness, we could plug it into the model in terms of if people are exposed, to what degree they, do they actually seek care, to what degree do they remain at home. We could capture aspects of how long they have illness in a key contribution, not where I don't show the data, but we could capture how well do people remember what they ate, say, a week ago, and report that as part of the, the process of outbreak response um, to allow the inspectors to zero in on the restaurant. We could capture how often are people going out to eat and what variety of different conditions. In short, we can uh, parameterize and calibrate a dynamic model using data collected via in this case, these smartphones. We do many similar things with, with data from other sources um, online, but I'm, I'm focusing in on here on the smartphone. Now, the final thing I'd like to talk about, though, is a bit more texture. And it's a very important point when it comes to dynamic modeling. And a very important contrast to how dynamic modeling is, is conducted traditionally. So here, we are engaged in filtering, as, it, as the term is uh, traditionally in engineering, noisy data. Not in the sense of throwing it out, but in the sense of taking, as it were, a consensus estimate between what the model's expecting and what the data says. And using it to, to correct the model expectations over time, to reground the model, to have an always updated model. So traditionally, the reflection here is, um, traditionally we build a model, a dynamic model, one of those rich models perhaps, multi-scale, et cetera, and then we use it for insight. Um, we run scenarios with it, et cetera, and often going back and, and rejigging that model to reflect the later evidence is a, is a very heavyweight process. Now, here we're going to be questioning um, that, that traditional process where we build a model and then we just kind of run it out, and as, as new data comes in, we have this hard choice, well, to what degree do we rely on these, these expectations of the model for tomorrow, for next week, for the next month, for the next year, that were, were based on the model, the model as it was formulated a year ago. And to what degree do we go through the hard, arduous process of updating that model, um, updating it to reflect what we know has occurred since then, um, which may be rather different um, from what we expected. The, the reflection to have here is look, we're dealing these days with increasingly rich models, but even the very best of models, where we have the, the very best of, 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 of experts who contribute to it, their understanding of the linkages, the causal mechanisms, our understanding of data, et cetera, it's gonna diverge from things in the world. Its expectations will diverge. At the least, we have differences in stochastics. Um, we, have, we have 
stochastic effects in the world, world uh, that are effectively stochastic from the standpoint of the scope of the model that are going to be different from what the model expects. And even the best of models, it's not going to be able to judge, you know, the vagaries of this, you know, of, of a weather event like a profound ice storm that, um, uh, that, that has big impacts on, on care seeking at a given time or the fluctuations of the economy or even the vagaries of um, political processes in our neighbors to the south. The vision here is to, to go beyond these static models. All too often we take a model, we build it, and then we put a blindfold on it to new data. Um, for anyone in the audience, whether you're calling from Pittsburgh or Baltimore or you're attending from uh, Montreal, um, you'll recognize that you have a very good understanding how to get from where you are right now to your home. Um, probably a very detailed understanding, an excellent mental model, but honed by many, many days of travel, et cetera. But you'd never attempt that to, to, to traverse, to rely on that model to such a degree that you do so blindfolded. You'd end up in a world of hurt. You'd, you know, you'd uh, head into traffic when um, uh, the, the cross signal is, is, is not appropriate, you get blindsided, or you'd be off in some minor detail of where the curb ends and, and end up with a you know, broken foot. Um, here, we're trying to take the blindfolds off our models. So the vision here, which is realized in many of our processes, uh, or many of our models, is, is to have quickly formulated and dynamically regrounded models. Models that can be automatically regrounded with the latest evidence, sharpened with that evidence, um, brought into line with that evidence in ways that we can use them to, to, to plan forward um, that reflects that evidence. So going from something like this, where the model is increasingly off base, as it were, from a year ago, and where it's constantly regrounded by the latest evidence to look forward to do the things that that data is not going to be able to do. We have data till now. Um, the data itself is not going to tell us what may be coming down the road, but we can use models for that and for what if questions and to, to in fact estimate the underlying state. It's kind of like a weather report. I mean, traditionally, when we have a weather report, it's not like there was a, we're relying on the weather report as it was given a, a week ago to, predict, to anticipate what's going to happen tomorrow. If, if we were in that situation, I don't know about Montreal, but, but in Saskatchewan, <laughs> we'd be in a bad way. Um, the weather report from a week ago may have been very accurate, but if we're relying on it still for each successive day, we'll be way off base. We're seeking instead to have something closer to what we have with weather, which is a constantly updating weather report, something that will allow us to, to constantly incorporate the latest evidence and project for it. So we have evidence from the past, and we can then, having grounded the model in that evidence, project forward in ways where we don't have data to anticipate what's coming. Or it's like a GPS. You know, with a GPS, um, it's not merely that it provides us with a step-by-step -step path to our goal as it was planned out when we left. The real power of it is that it, it's adaptive. It, it takes into account where we actually are now, no, not where we expected to be at this time and tells us you know, where to go to most effectively get to our, our goals. That's what we're seeking to do in terms of our, our interventions. Another way to look at these techniques is they're going to take multiple lines of high velocity evidence and combine them into a holistic system-wide picture that's going to knit together, this is a system competent data science, a piece of it, knit together these multiple lines of evidence using the model as the kind of substrate to link them up, to recognize how they're related to each other in a way that gives us this kind of, as it were, 3D depiction of the system, much as a MRI machine or CAT scan takes many solid images that are looked at in a, in a fragmented way, solitudes. They're from a particular angle with particular occlusions from bones and, and, and other uh, blockages having a very limited field of view, and it knits them together into a 3D view of, of the person. And there's three basic techniques uh, that we've used related to this. Um, particle filtering and particle MCMC are our tools of choice. These are sequential Monte Carlo methods and combinations of, uh, of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and sequential methods um, that are extremely powerful. And we conduct this for a wide variety of conditions. Um, 
uh, many of which are, are listed here that, that verge from, uh, uh, they range from um, um, uh, communicable disease to uh, aspects of chronic disease to zoonoses, et cetera. I'd like to give you a small vignette for this that, that harks back to our earlier data. Um, so we uh, undertook uh, one of several, what I think are really thought-provoking studies in these regards. Um, using data from the 2009-2010 flu pandemic, um, where we had data from um, uh, InfoSante in, uh, in Quebec um, and uh, emergency department data. Um, but we combine that with data from a much, by traditional views of, of health science, something that's much lower on the evidence pyramid. The, um, uh, volumes from, from Google search, or people searching related to, uh, uh, to flu. Uh, and we made use of a model um, actually drawn from work of uh, Ross Hammond at, at Brookings and Josh Epstein at, uh, there at, um, at Hopkins, which combined together um, a depiction not only of the spread of influenza as a pathogen, but the spread of anxiety or, or fear, as it was um, termed in the, in the article. And I don't have time to go into this. I want to stay within the, at the time frame here and finish up in just a couple minutes here. But th the key gist of um, what happened is we, we informed this model using only the highest quality evidence uh, in isolation. And we actually did this for Quebec, and I haven't shown it, but for Manitoba as well. So using clinical data alone and particle filtering, how well could that model predict forward what's likely to be coming in terms of the spread of infection and in terms of, of search queries uh, going forward? So we had a model using particle filtering where we projected forward. And um, it turns out, while many of our particle filter models allow really very accurate projection forward using uh, clinical data, um, in this case, it uh, fell short in terms of, um, of how well it could project. By contrast, when we used both search data, this higher quality, oh, excuse me, when we used uh, clinical data, this higher quality data um, that included lab, um, lab and, and clinically confirmed cases, uh, but combined it with search data, this kind of lower quality data that came from online and has all sorts of noise and, and, and confounders associated with it. We don't even know it's not the same person, sometimes searching multiple times. We found with that combination of this higher quality evidence, but key, absolutely central, combined with this more noisy, traditionally lower quality evidence, we could do vastly better. Now that's a somewhat non-intuitive result, that somehow by, by um, diluting, as it were, this gold of clinical data way up there, um, further up on the evidence hierarchy with, with this dross of, of um, data from online sources, we actually can very much improve the quality of, of uh, the model's prediction, the model's grounding in data in a way that better allows us to understand what's going on right now in terms of the latent state of the system in terms of um, projecting forward what's likely to happen, shown here, and in terms of um, asking what if questions about possible interventions. Turns out in, at a quantitative level, it enormously um, uh, improves the, the accuracy of the model. And in many of our projects uh, across uh, multiple conditions, uh, we have found that bringing in an additional data source that has different information into these models that are so-called filtered, these models that use this particle filtering or particle MCMC, can enormously enhance the effectiveness of uh, our ability to, to predict forward, yes, but to, to ground our understanding of what's going on right now in that three-dimensional view across the entire system, even areas of system which aren't measured by any one data source, by the virtue of the data we do have about other areas of the system and, and data from, and the model structure, we can get an understanding of what's going on in the other areas of the system. And then for asking what if questions. 
So increasingly, we're turning to a system which involves streaming data sources, whether it's, uh, for example, uh, Twitter or data from search volumes or web scraped data uh, released by uh, partners online uh, or data from um, social media. Um, uh, additionally, uh, whether it's Yelp or Tumblr or Instagram. Um, to really knit this together in ways that allows us to tap the richness of data, such as Twitter um, content, but is used to inform, in a streaming way, the, the model itself, in a way that regrounds the model whenever it comes in, regrounds it so we can look at the current model estimate of the system state, project forward, and, um, and ask what if questions um, uh, on, on a uh, intervention specific basis about counterfactuals where we don't have data, but where we leverage the powers of the model, its representation of generative pathways to look forward. So I'd like to leave you with some key take home messages here. Um, uh, dynamic models capture um, dynamic hypotheses, hypotheses about processes out there in the world that allows us to more quickly spot inconsistencies between what we think might be going on in the world as a working hypothesis and, and what actually is. In short, it can, sometimes models are held up, um, I think, to great disservice and contraposition to data as if they're, an al they're, they're a different thing than data and, and, a, and a, an alternative to data. But really, they help us greatly enhance the speed, the depth, and the reliability of learning from empirical evidence particularly the empirical evidence that we get from big data along multiple pathways. Models help us understand what's going on within the world, um, and they help us build more and more reliable hypotheses cross-checked by this data and help us ask how intervention might affect outcomes. The sort of big data we're dealing with, the data with those four Vs, volume, yes, but more importantly, velocity, variety, and veracity, um, these are shared with dynamic modeling. This is the underlying knitting together. What we get out of a dynamic model has the four Vs associated with it. It's a multi-pathway picture, so it's a lot of variety, it's high velocity, and it, it aspires to veracity, and it's typically very large. So models allow us to leverage the data science revolution in, in multiple ways. Yes, this filtering way, but also building hypotheses, cross-checking hypotheses, parameterization, and calibration of models. And machine learning methods, such as particle filtering, particle MCMC, as led by the, um, advanced by the fantastic efforts of my students, provide um, uh, multiple powerful ways of combining dynamic models in big data. I'm going to close with that. I would note, for anyone who's interested, we run uh, boot camps in these areas. Uh, they include uh, boot camps in uh, combinations of data science and system science but also boot camps related to uh, particular elements of this work, such as smartphone-based and wearable-based data collection and in agent-based uh, modeling. I also am pleased to say that we're discussing the possibility of an event for me on the McGill campus in another few weeks in mid-May, where uh, I can present in detail on this Ethica system that I presented for data collection from smartphones and wearables um, that will help people in a hands-on way um, uh, learn that system and uh, be able to apply it um, to, the, to the vast numbers of, of different needs it can address. So I'm going to stop there. I, I appreciate uh, Lorette and the moderator's uh, accommodation of, of a few extra minutes, and I'm eager for uh, questions here. Thank you very much. Uh, to Nathan, uh, and then would like to 